Hello and welcome. I'm Jeanez Castelgate, VP at Clarius. Thanks for joining us for today's very timely event, Ultrasound Guidance for Safe Brazilian Butt Lifts, Precision BBL Techniques from the Expert. You're among 1,100 plastic surgeons who registered for today's popular event. Shortly, we'll be introducing you to the creator of the Ultra BBL, the renowned Dr. Pat Pesmino, who uses real-time intraoperative ultrasound guidance for safe gluteal contouring procedures. He has over nine years of experience in using handheld ultrasound to improve patient safety and procedural outcomes. Now, even some of the most experienced plastic surgeons have accidentally performed intramuscular injections while performing blind gluteal fat grafting, with fat traveling to the heart or lungs and causing fatal emboli. Today, Dr. Pesminio will share his proven ultrasound techniques to clearly, in real time, ensure fat is placed above the muscle safely in the subcutaneous layer with millimeter accuracy for safe BBL surgeries every time. Before we get started, let me first introduce you to your host. Dr. Aron Frankel is trained in emergency medicine in California, has been using Pornicare ultrasound his entire career, and is a passionate POCUS educator. He practices in a busy academic teaching hospital in Vancouver as an emergency physician and serves as chairman of our Claris Medical Advisory Board. Welcome back, Dr. Frankel. Thanks, Janice. To set the stage for today's talk, there's been a growing narrative around improving safety around gluteal fat grafting. And I wanted to just lay out some of the landmark events in that history. Um, really, it started in 2018 with the, in response to an alarming number of deaths occurring from gluteal fat grafting, a multi-society task force for safety in gluteal fat grafting released a practice advisory that showed that the, there was an unusually high mortality rate estimated as high as one in 3,000, which is greater than any other cosmetic surgery. And the cause of mortality is, was uniformly fatal fat embolism due to fat entering the venous circulation associated with injury to the gluteal veins. And in every patient who died at autopsy, fat was seen within the gluteal muscle. So in no case of death has fat been found only in the subcutaneous plane. This led the task force to conclude that fat should never be placed in the muscle and only in the subcutaneous tissue, and admitted that it's easy to unintentionally enter the muscle during subcutaneous injection. As some of you who may have heard, there was a big news story uh, that came out of NBC in Florida that reported that at least 19 women have lost their lives in Florida following the cosmetic surgery in the last five years. Our guest speaker, Dr. Pasmino, was interviewed as part of the June news story this year and who confirmed that in 2021 alone, eight women in South Florida died from a fat embolism after a gluteal fat procedure. Despite the goal to only inject in the subcutaneous plane, blind injections have continued to cause fatalities. And so then in 2021, as part of this narrative, the ASAPS president commissioned a working group on patient safety and charged the group to address new guidelines that could affect the safety and welfare of patients undergoing gluteal fat grafting. And it was published in April of this year, the practice advisory. It was the first advisory developed since the working group was formed, which claimed also that mortality is likely due to uncertainty or lack of documentation as to the correct plane of fat injection. And so the newest and most compelling recommendations from these guidelines include the use of ultrasound guided documentation of the cannula placement prior to and during fat injection. And finally, the final piece in the narrative is in June of this year, the Florida Board of Medicine issued an emergency rule with the Department of State that mandates safeguards from the Aesthetic Society's practice advisory on gluteal fat grafting that was published in April. And it immediately enacted additional measures to protect patients who are elect to undergo this procedure, particularly in Florida that the surgeon performing the procedure must use ultrasound guidance when placing and navigating the cannula and injecting fat into the subcutaneous space to ensure it's placed above the fascia overlying the gluteal muscle. And the surgeon must also maintain those video recordings in the patient's medical record, including the time and date stamp of the ultrasound video recording. So before we jump in, we have a quick poll for you. In what time frame do you see adding ultrasound to your plastic surgery to improve patient safety? Is it already in practice? Is it coming within this coming year? Do you think it's coming in the next two to three, four to five years or not really in your future plans? This will kind of help set our stage of where people are at in integrating ultrasound into their practice. And it's a quick one, we'll close it out just to see where people are at. And it's no surprise that the vast majority of our participants here today are considering adding ultrasound to their practice quite soon. 
And we're glad to have you from all walks of practice really joining us. And we can't think of anyone better to have brought in to talk about improving the safety than the doctor who literally wrote the book on using real-time intraoperative ultrasound guidance for safe gluteal contouring procedures. He created the Ultra BBL, and with ultrasound equipment becoming portable, wireless, and affordable, it's opening the door to its use, even in the sterile field of the OR. Your expert speaker today is Dr. Pasmino, who completed his MD from the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, and then general surgery and plastic surgery residency at Baylor College of Medicine as well. Dr. Pasmino then brought this world-class education and training to South Florida, where he became a founding surgeon of Miami Aesthetic. Dr. Pasmino is nationally known for inventing new procedures, combining the latest techniques in aesthetic surgery with ultrasound, such as the Ultra BBL, which he'll talk a lot to us about today, the safest BBL available. And he's also known for being adept at performing a host of other body contouring surgeries, as well as performing a large facial aesthetics practice in my hometown of Miami. Dr. Pasmino, we're gonna hand it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Frankel, uh, truly. Um, I'm humbled by that uh, introduction. Today, we're gonna go ahead and talk about ultrasound guidance for safe Brazilian butt lifts. And we'll also talk about five other amazing ultrasound tricks just for plastic surgeons. My name is Pat Pasmino. I'm a, a board certified plastic surgeon uh, practicing in Miami, Florida. This is my contact info. <clears throat> On your cell phone, you can open any browser and type in drp.miami, and it'll automatically download my email, my phone number, and uh, my contact address. So this link will be in the bottom of every single slide today. So please reach out and let me know if you have any questions or if anything that I can do to help improve this talk. So I'd like to go ahead and do three poll questions today. And the first one that I'm going to ask is how long, how long have you been doing Brazilian butt lifts? So uh, please go ahead and answer that poll. So this is my central message today, that right now we are doing blind gluteal fat grafting. Right now, the procedure is blind. So it literally cannot become any more dangerous than it is now. Right now, because of the blind nature, it is a dangerous procedure. So if you add any ultrasound tomorrow, it will be a little bit safer. And the more often you use the ultrasound, the better you will go ahead and get. So my central message is you can do this tomorrow on tomorrow's BBL with any ultrasound machine. These are some of the ultrasound machines actually that, that I have. And I've been doing this now for nine years. Um, I started with smaller models, wired models, and now I'm using wireless portable models. But any ultrasound machine will work. You don't necessarily need to have one. You can even borrow one from anesthesia. So this brings me to my second question. If you're not using ultrasound in your practice today, why not? So please go ahead and uh, take a look at those answers and we'll share those results once they come. Now, a little bit of an update. What is actually going on in Florida? Well, this story begins in 2019 when the Florida Board of Medicine, they were very concerned because in 2017, we had five deaths from a BBL because of fat pulmonary emboli. This is when the doctor inadvertently went ahead and injected fat into the muscle. The fat traveled to the heart and lungs and it killed the patient. So because of that in 2017, in 2019, the Florida Board of Medicine mandated that all gluteal fat grafting had to be done above the muscle. Just think about that. That is the first time that a board of medicine mandated how doctors should perform a surgery. So that's what they mandated. And they also noted that violators could lose their medical license. Now, this is my last poll question today. When you perform a Brazilian butt lift, I want to put you into the shoes of Florida surgeons, because right now, when a Florida surgeon performs a Brazilian butt lift, if he does it perfectly, then the patient is safe and can get a good result. But if inadvertently some fat is injected into the muscle, that, that has potential of creating a fat pulmonary emboli, it could kill the patient, and it could jeopardize their medical license. So this is my question to you. When you perform a blind Brazilian butt lift today, would you bet your medical license that you were always injecting fat in the subcutaneous space? This is the mindset of Florida surgeons. And I'd like to ask uh, the audience how confident they are that they can always inject into the subcutaneous space. So let's go ahead and take a look at what, um, what happened since 2019. 
Now, we've been tracking closely the number of fat pulmonary emboli for the last 12 years. And what we found was that in 2020 and 2011, this is when we started doing BBLs, we only here in South Florida, we only had one or two BBL deaths a year. Now, in 2017, this number spiked to five. This is what alerted the Florida Board of Medicine and got everyone worried. In 2018, ACERF came out with guidelines recommending that fat only be injected into the subcutaneous space and recommended some guidelines, uh, some tips to go ahead and do that. We repeated that, uh, we repeated the survey in, 20, uh, in 2019 and we found that there was a dip in, um, in the number of uh, fat pulmonary, um, pulmonary emboli. This is also when the Florida Board of, Man, um, Board of Medicine mandate occurred. So after the Florida Board of Medicine mandate in 2019, in 2020, we were clapping ourselves on the back because we only had two deaths. Now, this is what's alarming. Last year, we have had more fat pulmonary emboli than ever before in history. Here in South Florida, and I think that's very important to, to note, we are not talking about the state of Florida. We are not talking about all of South Florida. We're just talking about Miami-Dade County. In Miami-Dade County, we had eight fat pulmonary emboli after this completely elective procedure. So jumping ahead till last month, the Florida Board of Medicine in their June 2022 meeting had to discipline in one meeting, three surgeons, each with a BBL death. So let's take a closer look. Surgeon A say, said that he had performed 6,000 BBLs. His medical license was restricted from doing a BBL for one year. Surgeon B stated that he had done 7,500 BBLs in, in his career. His medical license was restricted, so he can never do a BBL again. And then finally, the last surgeon who is not board certified, he had his medical license revoked. So the blind nature of this technique is dramatically affecting plastic surgeons. Surgeon B, in the public documents of the meeting, he wrote this, that this case has confirmed for him that it is simply too difficult to ensure during this blind procedure that he is in the appropriate place. And thus, it is not a procedure he wants to perform again. So think about this. Because of the blind nature of the procedure, he had his license restricted and he can never do this procedure again. So the blind nature of BBLs is what is literally killing patients and hurting surgeons. So after, uh, at that same meeting, the Florida Board of Medicine released an emergency rule for 90 days. And the rule stated that surgeons can only do three BBLs a day and that every BBL in Florida must use ultrasound and have date and time stamped ultrasound video in the patient chart. So Albert Einstein said in the midst of every crisis lies great opportunity. And that's where we find ourselves right now because we should see this as an opportunity to finally cut off our blindfold and become safer and better surgeons by actually seeing where our instruments are and how we're performing this procedure. So that's what I'd like to talk to, uh, to you about today, how ultrasound guided gluteal fat grafting can make this procedure safer, faster, and can make you a better surgeon. So let's talk a little bit about safety. Now, which ultrasound do plastic surgeons need? Well, this is a very common question that I get asked. We need a linear probe and with a high frequency because we work in the superficial tissue. The higher the frequency, the less deep it can see, but the better the resolution. Uh, it's a lot easier to see anatomy with a high frequency probe. I really like a portable and a wireless probe because it allows me complete freedom in the operating room. In 2022, these are three systems that are very popular among plastic surgeons, the Butterfly IQ, the Clarius, and the PS Imaging. Here are some prices. I think really one of, the, one of the distinguishing points is the quality of the picture. So these two on the right are high resolution systems. This means that you're gonna get a better picture with those systems. Now, let's actually see what's going on underneath the skin. When we look deep underneath the skin of the, of, of the gluteal area, there's actually two gluteal fascia. And this is analogous to the rest of the body. So there's a deep gluteal fascia, this is adherent to the external surface of the gluteus maximus. This is the fascia that we should never go under. So this is a stout wall, as Dr. Del Vecchio brilliantly showed in his uh, dynamic cadaver research. We, this deep gluteal fascia, if we keep it intact, it will protect us. So this is the fascia we should never go under. 
Now, between the dermis and the deep gluteal fascia, we have the superficial gluteal fascia. This is part of the superficial fascial system of the entire body. It is analogous to scarpus fascia. It's analogous to the SMAS. I call this layer the SMAS of the butt. And just like the SMAS, if we go ahead and preserve it, we can use it to our advantage. So let's take a look at some, some gluteal anatomy. So here in this video, we're gonna go ahead and go over some landmarks. Very easy, look at the top, this is the dermis. And down here, all this striated muscle, very obvious. That's the gluteus maximus. That dark layer above the gluteus maximus is the deep gluteal fascia. And now I'm pointing out the superficial gluteal fascia. So this is the difference between these fascia. The deep gluteal fascia, it's adherent. It's a very thick membrane. But look at the superficial gluteal fascia. This is very like bubble wrap. And then so when I move my probe back and forth, I can see these little bubbles of fat. So that is exactly what this looks like. So when you're going ahead and looking at, uh, at an ultrasound, it is very easy to orient yourself. Look for the dermis, look for the striated muscle. There you're gonna find the thick, deep gluteal fascia. And then here's the superficial gluteal fascia. You'll see these little bubbles. It'll sometimes look interrupted. That's totally fine. That's normal. So that's what we want to go ahead and do. So you now know all the gluteal anatomy. That, that you will need to go ahead and do this procedure. So something that we're also gonna talk about is how precise we can be with this technology. So the superficial gluteal fascia, it actually divides this subcutaneous region into two spaces, the superficial subcutaneous space and the deep subcutaneous space. And what we have learned is that when we add fat into the superficial subcutaneous space, so below the dermis and above the superficial gluteal fascia, this tends to flatten the butt. That's because this space is very, very fibrous. The fat graft cannot move freely through this. So uh, you know, sometimes you see some of these uh, butts that they look like a manhole cover. They don't look pretty, they're not round, they're very flat, they look like a disc. Or you see a peau de orange effect after fat grafting. That is because the fat was trapped between the dermis and the superficial gluteal fascia. Now, when you place fat underneath the superficial gluteal fascia and above the deep gluteal fascia, we're filling the deep subcutaneous space. And what this space does, it has much less fibrous tissue. Fat is easily able to migrate through this. This, is, this was shown also by Dr. Del Vecchio in his subcutaneous migration uh, paper. What we're gonna do today, we're gonna go ahead and place a deposit of the fat here, a deposit of the fat there, wherever we need it. And so we're gonna be able to expand these spaces all along the line that we want, but always within the deep subcutaneous space and preserving the superficial gluteal fascia. So let's go ahead and uh, review this. What we're, what we're talking about, ultrasound allows us to do targeted fat grafting. So for the first time, we can precisely add fat to either subcutaneous compartment. Today, we're gonna go ahead and show you how um, a, a case where I add fat into the deep subcutaneous compartment. I am literally creating a subfascial fat implant. I want to go ahead and create great central dome perkiness because that's what the patient wants. So here I am in the OR. This is a patient, I just finished 360 lipo on her. She's very, very thin. She had a BMI of 18. I took out 1000 cc's of lipo aspirate, uh, excuse me, of supernatant fat altogether. Let's go ahead and look at my ultrasound. So look, I'm orienting myself. There's the dermis, super clear. Remember my probe is right on top of the dermis. There's the dermis, there's my landmark. Let's look at my other landmark, the strided muscle of the gluteus maximus. Very obvious, very, very clear. Then we see that thick white membrane on top of the gluteus maximus. That is the deep gluteal fascia. So those are our, our big landmarks, super obvious. The dermis, the gluteus maximus and the deep gluteal fascia. Now in between the dermis and the deep gluteal fascia, that is going to be right in here, my superficial gluteal fascia. So I always want to stay above the deep gluteal fascia because underneath that's dangerous. That's where we can get a fat pulmonary emboli. So I always wanna stay above that. And I would like to stay below the superficial gluteal fascia. And then take a look at the bubbly nature of the superficial gluteal fascia. That is like bubble wrap. It's fascia, but it's impregnated with fat pockets. And so we want to go ahead and to get into this area. And so this is what I think is also really important about an ultrasound. The best thing about an ultrasound, this is a, uh, this is a sonographic ruler. 
So we're going to be able to measure these compartments and really see in real time exactly what our fat graft is doing. So here I'm just highlighting the little fat pockets. And that's sometimes what people get thrown by because the superficial gluteal fascia, it's not as uh, adherent. It's not as planar as a deep gluteal fascia, but don't worry about that. That is bubble wrap. Okay. In this thin patient, um, Pat, you know, I just want to point out, it, it looks like the depth to that deep gluteal fascia is really using the ruler on the side of the screen, maybe two centimeters. So you can really see kind of how easy it would be without ultrasound guidance to just accidentally enter into, you know, the right. no-go zone. 100% Orin, thank you. What I'm pointing out now with the yellow arrows, that's the sonographic ruler. And so then the big white circle is one centimeter. And just what Orin said, look at that. That big circle there, that's two centimeters deep. So the deep gluteal fascia is 2.1 centimeters, just like Orin said, below the skin. So think about this. We are working in an area that is less than an inch thick. And before ultrasound, we never knew what we were doing. We were doing this procedure completely blindly. And that's exactly why surgeons who were well-intentioned, they sometimes got into the wrong place. But now, because it's a, uh, is so affordable and so easy to go ahead and use, there's no excuse to do this procedure blindly anymore. Thank you, Orrin. So what we're doing now, we have the landmarks, super easy. The dermis, we all can see that. The, uh, the strided muscle, the gluteus maximus, we can see that. The deep gluteal fascia, the superficial gluteal fascia, all of us can see that. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take my cannula and I'm going to place it into the deep subcutaneous space. So just to review, the deep subcutaneous space is between the two fascia. It's above the deep and below the superficial gluteal fascia. So I'm going to highlight the spaces uh, real quick, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. I think what's something interesting, what Oren was talking about, that space, if you measure it, it is 0 0.8 centimeters. So thin. And so these are the two spaces. So I want to put the fat into the deep subcutaneous space. It is really thin, zero, 0 0.8 cent. It's eight millimeters. My cannulas are often three, four millimeters. The only way I can consistently put a cannula of that size into that thin a space, I can't do it blindly. I have to do it with ultrasound. And again, you can do this with any ultrasound. So now that I have identified my target, I am now going to go ahead and place my cannula right inside. All right, let's get to work. So. Uh, for this patient, again, she had a BMI of 18, very, very thin. I call this a skinny ultra BBL. I went ahead and I did 360 lipo on her. We also went ahead and did high definition abdominal etching, which uh, I can do with ultrasound. And then that's, that's another topic. Now I'm going to go ahead and start injecting. So the first thing that I do, remember this is sculpture. So we want to create an aesthetic procedure. What I did, I picked the point that I want to uh, augment first. Once I picked that point, I put the ultrasound there and now I advance the cannula to the ultrasound. So look, this is another super tip um, for, the, for everyone. Don't move your ultrasound. The more you keep your ultrasound in place, the better the picture will be. So that way, if I don't move my ultrasound, the only thing that's moving is the cannula. That's it right there, it's just a big, white thing for lack of it's it's hyper it's uh hyper echoic but it's a big white thing right underneath the superficial gluteal fascia look at that i'm turning my cannula you can see the holes of my mercedes tip and so now that i've confirmed that i'm, I'm underneath i'm just going to reposition go a tiny bit lower perfect look at that i am below the superficial gluteal fascia and above the deep gluteal fascia. Now that I confirmed I'm in the right place i can start adding fat and so when i start adding fat it's going to look like a gray cloud Again, my cannula is the only thing that's moving. And there you go. Look at that. Look how cool this is. I'm expanding the space. Remember, it started at 0.8 centimeters. Look at this. I am filling this completely. And look at the area above the superficial gluteal fascia. That has not changed. It is still dark. So what that means, I have not damaged my superficial gluteal fascia. I've literally created a subfascial implant with this. And by doing this, you are literally seeing subcutaneous fat migration. The fat is migrating through the deep subcutaneous space exactly the way that I want. So. This is an important point. Here, I needed a little extra force. And so I injected with both hands, but I never moved my tip. So you never move your tip unless you confirm where you are with the ultrasound. This is what I'm pointing out, the area of subcutaneous migration. I injected in one spot and I was able to go ahead and augment 
the whole area here, the whole central dome. Let's take a look at my fat graft. Beautiful. My fat graft, look at that. It's expanded the deep subcutaneous space. The superficial is still intact. It's still pristine. And it's created this little mountain of subcutaneous tissue. So now that I've gotten my first point, <clears throat> I want to go ahead and inject fat uh, in my next aesthetic point. And so uh, this patient, when we talked beforehand, she really wanted to get great hips. So we're going to start going laterally and start injecting there as well. In this, uh, in this video, I'm pointing out that the superficial gluteal fascia still intact right there. It's, that's a little uh, fat a lobule that's impregnating the superficial gluteal fascia. So these are the steps. Find where you want to go next. Remember, this is an aesthetic procedure. You're a sculptor. You're not a blind squirter. That's where I want to go next. So I go ahead and with the ultrasound, I can see this is the limit of my subcutaneous migration. Now that that's where I want to go, I leave my ultrasound there and then I advance my cannula to go under the ultrasound. I've identified where I want to go, put the ultrasound, bring the cannula to the ultrasound. Try not to move the ultrasound too much until you identify the cannula. There, my cannula is a little bit high. Now I got it. Super easy. The more you keep your cannula, the more you keep your probe still, the easier this is going to be for you. So now that I know exactly where I am, I start injecting and boom, I have some great, great expansion of the space. And I am able to go ahead and do this safely. Because I'm not moving this, I am now just going to go ahead and inject with both hands. One technical point, the lateral hip is much more forgiving than the central dome. We never here in Miami, we've, we've attended 11 autopsies of these patients. We've never had a patient who had fat only in the lateral hip. So this is a more forgiving area. So um, sometimes if you, um, uh, it, it's it just, it just much, it, it's much safer to inject laterally than in the central dome. That's where people get, get their problems. So there I'm injecting, but look at this. I'm not, the most important thing is not the ultrasound. The most important thing is the patient. I want to create a beautiful aesthetic result and I am going ahead and doing so. And so I'm moving the cannula just a little bit. Again, I'm very, very anterior. And then that's why uh, you, you have a margin of safety there. So they're gonna go ahead and give me another syringe. And I'm just going to pick my next point and I'm going to start injecting there. So this is an aesthetic artistic procedure. You, uh, you are now a sculptor with a brand new tool that allows you to be more powerful and more precise. And so when you, when you do this, I, in that, in that instance, I put my cannula where I wanted to inject. And then I confirmed with the ultrasound I'm above the deep gluteal fascia. So perfect. I'm totally safe. I can go ahead and inject. And that is, that is key. <clears throat> so one, one myth I want to dispel, I'm not watching the ultrasound the entire time. What I'm watching is my aesthetic result, but I'm using the ultrasound to confirm every single position change. That's super important. So this is really, I, I feel this is crucial with, an, uh, with a skinny ultra BBL like this patient, because she had so little fat to use. I really want to make every single drop count. So here I'm continuing to expand her hips. I don't know if you guys can see that difference. And so these patients can be very difficult because they don't have a lot of fat. They are fibrous, but the ultrasound allows me to put the fat graft every single drop in the most accepting spaces. So here, uh, I'm st you know, in, in there, you see that my cannula tip, perfect. It's below the superficial gluteal fascia. That's gonna be a really healthy shot. So I'm gonna go ahead and start injecting. Start injecting. From a technical point of view, it seems um, you know, that that's a pretty large cannula compared to a lot of the needles that people are used to maybe seeing for ultrasound guided procedures. It seems pretty easy to see the cannula that, that that's that big and catch it in plane with the ultrasound probe. Orin, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. That I mean, these cannulas, they're thick walled and uh, they can be three, four millimeter cannulas, and they are much, much thinner than the than the uh, the needles that people use for nerve blocks. Exactly right. And that's what makes this really straightforward. If you do three of these cases, you're going to feel comfortable. That's the learning curve. Do three cases and that, uh, that will get you to a very comfortable position. So I'm done. I'm done on that side. Okay. I'm just confirming one, uh, one point here. Take a look at the clock on the OR wall, 1116. I went ahead and I did this side in 10 minutes. And this is with me talking and wasting time. 
half the time. So that's another myth that I would like to dispel about ultrasound guided fat grafting. It does not take long. It does not make the procedure take longer. In fact, in my hands, it's faster because I can very quickly see where I am. I can inject and go, inject and go. I'm hitting each of my aesthetic points. Now here I'm showing that before we started, the deep space was 0.8 centimeters. When I'm done, it was 2.9 centimeters. We more than tripled the height of the deep space. And we did this very safely. The patient uh, does not have any of the Poto orange effect. She has the fat in the most favorable bed. And now we're gonna go to the other side. Take a look at the other side. Here's the dermis. There is the deep gluteal fascia and the gluteus maximus. Look how clear these compartments are. So we can just go ahead and start again. And so that is, that is the key here on the other side. The superficial gluteal fascia is totally intact. I'm going to inject into that space. And look at that space, that's 0.8 centimeters. So I have not expanded this space. The other space, I've more than tripled. So this, I can just go ahead and repeat. And again, this is an artistic procedure. So identify where you want to first go ahead and create that projection, put the probe there, advance the cannula to the probe, and then inject only after you've confirmed that you are above the deep gluteal fascia. Ultrasound guided gluteal fat grafting can be used on any patient, even very thin ones like the one I just showed you. It can be used with any position of the patient, any cannula, any incision, any injection, and no additional OR time. It only adds $5 per case. The $5 is for the sterile cover that I put around the uh, ultrasound probe. Ultrasound in the OR can be used by any surgeon. It can make this procedure for once safe reproducible and teachable. This makes ultrasound guided gluteal fat grafting ultra safe, ultra fast and ultra better, excuse my grammar. Now, what I would like to do at this point is give you five ultrasound tips in five minutes. So tip number one, other, re other things that I use ultrasound for, I use it before I see patients. And so I've created a system where uh, my staff can go ahead and measure the size of the compartments before surgery. And then what we do is that we have these circles. And so my staff will, will measure, okay, here's a circle of 12 centimeters in diameter, and they measure how thick that deep uh, subcutaneous space is. And so here, for example, if that space is two centimeters thick, just by simple math, if you can double the height, you're going to be able to fill that space with 450 centimeters, uh, 450 cc's. Then if you have multiple circles, you can go ahead and have, uh, have the circles uh, encompass the butt. And then by, me by knowing, okay, this disc is gonna be able to have this much, this much, and that much, you can add it up. And then you can tell the patient beforehand in your deep subcutaneous space, you have room for approximately 820 cc's. So this allows me to really talk to the patients. And if the patients uh, want a bigger augmentation, I can talk to them and I can say, look, um, you have a 10 gallon tank. There's no point putting 15 gallons of gas inside. Let's stage your procedure. Let's go ahead and do so. The, the last piece of this puzzle, you know, I, I will admit is the laxity of the tissue because in that first, in the patient that I just showed you, I did not double her space. I tripled her space. So that's something that I'm working on now, trying to predict the laxity, the distensibility of the procedure. This is a, a, a patient from last week that she already had a BBL at another clinic and she was not happy with her waist, with her contour, and especially with the hip dips, that was very difficult. So I identified the areas beforehand that there was a lot of fibrous tissue. I broke that up. I filled that out and uh, she got a great result. She's very happy with that. Ultrasound tip number two, evaluating postoperative edema and seroma. So the way we do this in my office, my staff identifies seroma in the clinic with an ultrasound. It is that easy. Whenever they find something, then they tell me about it. I go ahead and I confirm. I then aspirate, which is what I'm doing right now. And what Orin is talking about here, this is a plain 18 gauge needle. I was able to get into this space. This uh, patient had a tummy tuck previously and had some swelling. And I was able to get out uh, even a small amount of fluid. So this is wonderful for identifying small seromas. The, the bigger the seroma, the easier it is. But sometimes these small seromas, they can be tricky. We can miss them sometimes. And if we miss them, then they can become gelatinous. They can go ahead and create a, um, a, a deformity, a long-term. Patients 
love this. Why? Because they love a flat look. They love coming in, having a drainage, and then looking so much better. Sometimes they love it, in fact, too much. I've had patients come in after a seroma with more swelling. I looked at them and I said, you know, it doesn't look like a seroma again. It just looks like swelling. And then they don't believe me. They think that I, I'm just saying that because I don't want to go ahead and drain them. So that's when ultrasound comes in. Ultrasound is a second opinion. I can go ahead and put the ultrasound on the patient and say, look, for sure you do or do not have a seroma. So that certainly helps. Ultrasound tip number three, in every abdominoplasty that I do, I do an intraoperative tap lock. And so I'll typically do this after I've already elevated the skin flap and after my plication. So here there's no skin because I've elevated this. And then, so here you can see my needle. It's going through the external oblique, going through the internal oblique. It's getting into that plane between the internal oblique and the transversus. And so there you go. Okay. I just pierced it and then I can start adding it. And this takes me about one to two minutes per side. Patients love this. They are so much more comfortable. Uh, my patients take uh, pain medicines for three days. If they take it for four, there's an issue. Then I go to the other side and I do the same thing again. My needle has gone through the external oblique, the internal oblique. In between, I'm going ahead and expanding the area. Perfect. Look how beautiful that is. You can see the fascia between the uh, internal oblique and the transverses expand, and you see that expand beautifully. The one thing that always amazes me about uh, the tap lock is look down here. I am literally a millimeter or two away from the intestine. So to me, it's just insanity to go ahead and try to do this blindly like they used to do in the old days. There's no need for that. Now for breast surgery, this is ultra tip number four. I do a PEC one and two block. And so here's my needle. It's going through the subcutaneous tissue. I am approaching the pectoralis major. This is a sonographic needle, so it's a little bit more blunt. That's why there's a little more resistance. I, boom, I pop through. There you go. I pop through the pec major. I'm going into the pec minor. If I inject right there between the pec major and pec minor, that's a pec two block. But I want to inject some there and deeper. So I'm going to push to go down to the fourth rib. I'm injecting underneath the pec minor and above the serratus. There you go. Oh, how beautiful. It's an again, ad. you know, that, that next line is the plura. So, you know, yes. this is also not a one you would do blind, but, you know, with the ultrasound, you can see that do it safely, even with all these um, critical structures nearby. Or an absolutely. And, you know, one modification that Dr. Salzman made that uh, was extremely helpful. He goes lateral because the way anesthesiologists do it, they just go straight down. And um, I just, you know, I don't have the cojones to be that close to the plura. <laughs> So this is a lot safer, but that, that really helps the patients. And then this gives you the reputation of being a safe surgeon, a comfortable surgeon. This is what patients will remember. And this is what they'll tell their friends. The last ultra tip that I would, uh, I would give today is practice makes perfect ultrasound. This is the stethoscope of the 21st century. None of us grew up. None of us were born knowing how to use a, a stethoscope in medical school. We practiced. We practice on friends, we practice on in family, and that's what ultrasound takes. It just takes a little bit of practice to get the ultrasound eye and to work on your hand-to-eye coordination. For plastic surgeons, anatomy is beautiful and straightforward. We understand this stuff. When you put the ultrasound, you're going to be amazed. You're going to say, oh my gosh, that's the rectus. That's that's the arcuate ligament. That's, that's everything that we know is underneath there. So I would recommend uh, to everyone, look for opportunities to practice. Practice on your patients before surgery, inside the OR, after surgery, practice in the clinic, practice uh, in the OR, even practice at home. I practice on my wife all the time. And she'll tell you. Ultrasound is an incredible new tool for plastic surgeons because it allows us to preserve and respect the subcutaneous anatomy, to plan surgical procedures, to target and release specific fiber structures and target and precisely fill any subcutaneous space. Now, ultrasound with gluteal fat grafting, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We can use this for precise breast fat grafting. It allows me to inject around an implant without taking out the implant. So it's wonderful. Breast implant assessment, it can be used before and around surgery. Uh, you can go ahead and use this to uh, manage seromas, tap blocks, pec blocks, facial applications, so much more.
so much more. My call to action, try it. Just try this. It's very, very cheap. Think about all the other junk that um, companies try to get us to buy. This is between, you know, $3,000 and $4,000. You can even, I, I've gotten these on eBay for less than $1,000. The picture is not great, but it's, it's usable. Um, no disposables for this device. The only thing that I use in the OR is the cover to keep it sterile. This can be used in the OR and the clinic. We really are in a golden age of ultrasound because not only have companies uh, like Clarius miniaturize the crystal so you can get a beautiful, beautiful picture, they have also added artificial intelligence. And so what that means is that you can focus on the patient, you can focus on your result, because as soon as you put the ultrasound onto the, onto the patient, the artificial intelligence kicks in and it tries to optimize the picture. So you don't have to you know, mess with knobs, you don't have to go ahead and do a lot of adjustments, focus on your patient, and then that's that's where we are now. I want to thank everyone for their attention and their time. Uh, it's always an honor to present to my colleagues, and I'm very excited to see the new applications all of you will come up with so that I can learn from you next time. Thank you very, very much. That's great, Pat. Thanks so much uh, for your time here. And please stay tuned. We're going to have Q&A. Uh, I see there's a lot of great questions there. But first, we wanted to just show what this kind of looks like in live practice. Um, I'm going to confess, I've never done gluteal fat grafting. I've scanned um, buttocks for nerve blocks, but I've certainly have never really looked at the fascial planes before. So I'm hoping, Pat, maybe if I have any trouble, you can talk me through. Uh, but we have a model here who is volunteered to demo it. And I'm an emergency doctor. So if, even if I can do it, I mean, I think that tells you uh, what you guys can do. You do much more technical procedures uh, sometimes. And so here I've got the uh, L7 transducer, and I'm on a plastic surgery preset. And I'm at a depth at about four centimeters. Does that sound about right? Four to five centimeters? It does. I think that's a very okay. good start. Yes. Great. So I'm just going to expose the buttock here. Okay. And kind of watching what you did, we're going to follow the C1, do one. Um, maybe one day I'll teach one approach. So I'm just kind of going on here. And let's see if I can navigate. All right. So maybe my depth is even too much because I can see already here. I'm going to improve my depth. Let me make it look. And then here we go. I can see. Um, the, the deep fascia is right there in the middle of the screen, right? Would you say that's it? Absolutely. I mean, that looks yep. to me like it's about 11 to 12 millimeters below the skin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, I, I usually use, I just kind of eyeball things with the three centimeter. If we wanted to measure it, I suppose we could do the distance on here of the top to there's the deep fascia. So 11 millimeters. And so then this is the superficial fascia right here, right? So this would yes. be the... Uh, the other one would be kind of here to the superficial fascia. Yes. Is that right? So really, I mean, yeah, you're really making the point that that is a pretty narrow window there uh, to enter if that's your target space. I can't imagine doing that blind and then avoiding, you know, everything deeper. Um, and then you would come in, you know, you put, I saw you put the port up here superior uh, and then so kind of just enter in and really just kind of line up the transducer of where you want it. Um, and I saw what you did was sort of as you angle it, then you kind of follow the anatomy lateral so maybe somewhere around here and uh there's the deep fascia again in the middle of the screen with the, that bubble wrap appearance i see there's a little bit more space here so um the deep fascia kind of down to this spot right right there yes you call that the deep fascia yeah and then wow. and i saw one one great trick you pointed out um which is not really something i do in my practice but i could see how if you're entering in the same port you kind of come here you're just going to rotate that scanner so that you're in the same axis right so you can kind of use the same port and then just sort of slide the probe and then find, because that cannula is so big, you can really identify it easily. I think it'd be hard with a tiny needle to really find it in, in the tissue here. But uh, with that big thing, I, I imagine you could pick it up pretty easily, no matter how, where lateral you go, just kind of maybe rotating as you kind of swing out lateral. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, you, you made, you made an, a really important uh, technical point that we are using thick cannulas. And so that just makes it easier to go ahead and pick up on this. And yeah. Uh, to me, you know, when, whenever, um, whenever I see a, um, an ultrasound, uh, excuse me, whenever I see a BBL presentation, I always want to ask the speaker, how, how, how uh, deep is the, uh, the muscle in that patient? If you aren't looking, you aren't measuring and you don't know. And yeah. uh, this patient was, uh, was very thin and um, uh, you're working, surgeons have to work in a very tight, thin space. And if they guess incorrectly, the, the consequences could be catastrophic. Yeah, and I could see how also the imaging quality, I know you said all the ultrasounds work, but that the, 
the more detail you could get um, to really see that five, six millimeter space sometimes seems kind of critical to do it right uh, and really kind of see what you need to see. Great, well, we still have uh, some time here and I definitely want to pick your brain with Q&A. Uh, before we get there, please keep filling the Q&A. We'll try to get as many of these as we can, but to, to take it home, you know, um, just to summarize, maybe we could do this together, the six ways that you see ultrasound essential in your practice. Uh, we talked about in the beginning, we set the stage with the evolving regulations. You practice in a maybe the most regulated environment for this procedure. Uh, would you say that that's true? I would. I mean, and yeah. you know, it's uh, nobody wants that. I mean, Florida is not really known. Florida is not California. Florida is not known yeah. for a lot of regulation. But you know, uh, the board of medicine. I mean, my God. I mean, when there when there are so many patients dying from an elective aesthetic procedure, uh, they have to yeah. do something. Yeah, I would say that even, you know, you were showing kind of the, the preceding history, but even maybe one a year is still maybe too many for a cosmetic elective procedure. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, I, as you kind of alluded to, the, the entire message you're giving of planning for safer and better outcomes, uh, really, I think that kind of hits home and um, showing how you can see your cannula uh, really kind of reinforces the outcomes. And then I love nerve blocks uh, in my practice in acute care. So I can imagine post-operative your patients, we've heard from other surgeons who have done webinars, uh, patients really love it, you know, going out to dinner after their procedures, um, you know, and their friends can't believe it that they're in so little pain afterward. You know, I imagine that uh, bodes well for you as a surgeon. And then, um, you know, that kind of jumps ahead to number six, where then they tell all their friends, right, about how great you were as a practitioner and, uh, you know, how little pain they had and what a good result they got. I imagine that really, really goes home. Exactly. I mean, I've been in practice now for 19 years and what, uh, what I've learned is that, uh, number one in plastic surgery is the result. And that's, that's what patients care about the most. And right now, right after that, they care about their experience. And so mm -hmm. I've never had a patient come in and say, Oh, you know, I came to you because of how fast you do your surgery. Patients don't refer. Right. <laughs> patients refer because uh, they, you know, because their friends say, "My gosh, you look so good. I want that result too." Or they talk to their friend and say, "It was so easy. Uh, it was so much, you know, so much less difficult than a C-section." Uh, other, other, you know, uh, other friends of mine have had nightmares of this procedure. You do it very gentle. That's why the patient will come back, and that's why their friends will come in too. Well, um, keep filling the Q&A, please. We have some time left. Uh, before we get there, I'm gonna hand it back to Jazz here to take us home. Um, proof that your patients love it. And we'll hand it here to Jeanette. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Pesmino, for allowing us to come into your office, film those patient procedures, and even uh, have an interview with you, but as well as an interview with one of your patients. Here, one of your patients noted that she was really excited uh, she says that the two of you talked about the procedure and about how you do it, and it was different uh, by using ultrasound technology, and that made her feel like it would be a much safer procedure. So thank you for that. Um, and, and thank you as well, uh, Dr. Frankel, for the live scanning. It's always fun and amazing to see the newly released third generation Claris HD3 in action. Um, and thank you to all of you for your interest in ultrasound. So just before we start our live Q&A session with Dr. Bismino, here's a quick poll question for you. We'd love to help you continue on your journey to bring ultrasound best practices to your plastic surgery practice. So please do complete this poll. You can select as many options as are shown here. Price and availability does vary by region. So please feel free to request a quote and pricing. You may opt to speak to one of our experts about the advantages of wireless ultrasound for your practice. If you'd like to discuss scanner features, please select that option. You can also book a virtual one-on-one -on -one demo with our experts to see the new Claris HD3 in action in an interactive session. And we can send you more ultrasound video tutorials for plastic surgery so you can continue to learn. Uh, please go ahead and select as many options as you wish while you complete the poll. I'd like to take a minute uh, to tell you more about the world's first third generation wireless ultrasound. Our new Clearis HD3 scanners deliver the highest definition ultrasound imaging in a handheld scanner. It's the leading choice for plastic surgeons to clearly visualize superficial anatomy. The use of ultrasound in plastic surgery has been proven to improve procedural outcomes, minimize complications, and enable comprehensive follow-up, enhancing confidence and the overall patient experience. Clearis is routinely used to guide safe BBL fat grafting, to examine breast implant integrity, to evaluate and treat seromas, to guide safe facial fillers, and for performing tap and pec blocks under ultrasound guidance for the most effective pain management. 
Today, you saw Dr. Pesminio use the Claris L7 HD3 optimized to deliver best in class ultrasound imaging to 11 centimeters for full body procedures. Now, 30% smaller, more affordable with an enclosed battery, Clarius is more specialized with a new advanced aesthetic software package that streamlines workflows with dedicated plastic surgery preset. Our wireless scanners deliver several advantages. Uh, Clarius is unrivaled for near field and high resolution imaging in a handheld device. As you saw today, you get full visibility of facial layers, muscles, vascular structures, seromas, and other anatomy to guide plastic surgery procedures. The secret lies in each scanner with eight beam formers, 192 crystal elements, and artificial intelligence that deliver the crystal clear image quality only found in traditional systems, but at a mere fraction of the cost of cart-based systems. AI replaces complex knobs and buttons, making ultrasound imaging fast and easy to learn and use. And Claris is also wireless, freeing up space with zero footprint for portability in a variety of settings from the consultation room to the operating room. You get free movement with no more wires getting in the way or touching your sterile prep areas. And Claris is fully immersible, so it's so much faster to clean and disinfect. Only Claris delivers wireless scanners with an ecosystem that includes a free app for your iOS or Android devices, and that can be phone or tablets with free updates. Available with our new membership, Claris Cloud is available to easily capture and manage unlimited exams from anywhere. Your membership includes in-app Claris Classroom video tutorials with experts like Dr. Pesminio and onboarding with Claris clinicians to build up your ultrasound scanning skills. And Claris Live delivers one-click telemedicine if you'd like to share live scanning with a colleague for a second opinion. Also included with your membership, the new Advanced Aesthetic Package offers more flexibility for surgeons who need additional customizations for plastic surgery examinations and procedures in the realm of fa uh, facial aesthetics, breast augmentation, BBL, hair follicle imaging, and more. And coming soon, our innovative R&D team will be releasing a new BBL preset that includes new screen capture recording options. For clinicians who prefer a one-time purchase over a membership, the advanced aesthetic package is available as an add-on purchase. We'll now take three seconds to close the poll. Two, one. Thank you for participating and we'll get back to you in the coming week. I'm also pleased to say that we'll be hosting another webinar on August 9th with Dr. MJ Roland Warman from SmileWorks founder, who will teach expert techniques for visualizing facial layers and vascular structures for the safest and best filler outcomes. I know many of you also offer facial aesthetic treatments, and you're all invited to, to join Dr. MJ for her session on avoiding filler complications using ultrasound to guide safe cheek, temple, and tear trough injections. Please complete this poll to save your seat. Dr. MJ considers ultrasound to be the most groundbreaking development in aesthetic medicine since the invention of filler. It's giving medical practitioners an edge by looking under the skin to effectively visualize blood vessels and nerves to avoid complications, while also placing fillers in the right plane for the best results, more predictable outcomes with less product. Again, please complete this poll to pre-register and we will send you a confirmation email in the coming days. Three more seconds, two, one. Now on to our live Q&A session. Please use the questions icon in the menu bar to ask your questions for Dr. Frankel and Dr. Pesmedio. Dr. Frankel, if I can invite you to moderate. Sure, yeah, let's just jump in because we only have a few minutes and there's a lot of questions. So to summarize uh, a bunch of these questions, Dr. Pesmedio, how do you record your ultrasounds, right? That was one of the documentation requirements in Florida. Right. Um, great, great question. I mean, there, there's some excellent technical questions here. Um, <clears throat> some people ask about the probe cover. You can use any probe cover that you want. Um, I, I typically find them on Amazon. They're very, very cheap. That's number one. Number two, um, you know, I think one thing that you found that I was doing in the operating room, I was using a, a Bluetooth gyroscopic remote. And that's how I was controlling my tablet. And so for that reason, I really like the Android tablet because it's a lot, I'm an Apple guy, but I love the Android for this because you can go ahead and control it from the, from the sterile field. And uh, when, I, um, when I do this, I, uh, you, know, you saw me record and you saw, um, you saw the camera as well. Um, <clears throat> I can, you can go ahead and do a, a screen recording, but you know, I happen to, um, I've heard that, um, uh, they are currently under development of uh, building in that capacity into one of the modes of Clarius. 
So that's going to be, you know, uh, Clarius has been very, very supportive of plastic surgeons. And what, uh, what it'll be, it'll be just touch and go. You'll be able to launch the mode, record, so that way you can meet the requirements as well. Dr. Francis asked, the fat migration study has suggested that fat can migrate through the DGF through small perforations. With multiple passes in through SGF into the deep subcutaneous space, don't you think there's migration from the deep subcutaneous to the superficial subcutaneous space? That's an incredibly important question. What the, um, if, you know, he's referring to uh, one of the studies from Dr. Del Vecchio is a dynamic cadaver study. And what Dr. Del, Del Vecchio proved in the lab was that a, uh, if the cannula makes a small pass through the DGF, that little, that little rent in the, in the fascia is not big enough for fat to go from the subcutaneous space into the muscle. So surgeons should not be worried if they have one or two inadvertent passes into the DGF. I've done it. We've all done it. What Dr. Del Vecchio showed, the only way that fat can go from the subcutaneous space into the deep muscle, excuse me, into the muscle is when there was actually a defect, not a perforation, but a defect of the deep gluteal fascia. In that paper, he took a one centimeter biopsy and he created a one centimeter defect. And through that large hole, fat can migrate through. So just with a rent from the cannula, fat will not, will not get there. Now, Dr. Francis also talked about the opposite. What if the cannula goes through the superficial gluteal fascia? Can some of the fat that's in the deep subcutaneous space leak into the, sub, into the superficial subcutaneous space? The answer is yes, absolutely. And sometimes uh, you see that. Sometimes um, those are called blowout fractures where you see just a little bleb of uh, fat that's been, that's bubbled through a rent. And again, the superficial space has much more fibrosis. So it creates like a little column and you'll see a little bleb. And that's when you can get fatty cysts. That, that's when you can get necrosis. So again, you want to uh, be careful. Um, you want to avoid damaging the, uh, any anatomy that you don't have to. And you want to target the spaces very accurately. Um, we're almost out of time. Let's try and squeeze one more question in. Do you ever teach uh, hands-on? Sure. There's several people want to know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you guys have my contact information. It's drp.miami. Uh, put it in any web browser and um, I'm happy. I'm happy to send you links. Most of the stuff that I have, I just get on Amazon. So I can send you links for uh, any, any toy that you want. I'm happy to answer questions. I have little videos that I can send you and follow up with, with uh, techniques. Um, I've always been so impressed by the ingenuity and the creativity uh, of plastic surgeons. So this is a tool that if you guys try it, you're going to find new applications. And I, I, I can't wait to sign on to the webinar and learn from you guys next time. Great. Well, we're at the top of the hour. Uh, we will follow up with the questions we did not get to in the coming days. And I'll uh, let you take us home and close out. Yes, absolutely. You'll also all receive a copy of the slides and we've recorded today's webinar and should be available in the coming days as well. So keep an eye out on your email for a link to those assets. I would like to thank Dr. Pesminio for inviting us into his office to film patient procedures so we could bring you today's webinar. Thank you also to our host, Dr. Frankel, for all of his insights and a very, very big thank you to all of you for joining us today. We hope to see you again on August 9th for our next aesthetic webinar on how to use ultrasound to avoid filler complications featuring Dr. MJ. In the meantime, we hope you have a great day and keep scanning. Keep scanning. Bye everybody. <laughs>